Well, thank you. Thank you, Renee, and welcome to everyone uh, to Intersection, where theology and practice meet. Uh, today, we've got two special guests with us, Dr. Tim Sinsing, Dr. Mason Lee, and we're going to be picking up the conversation around what does preaching in a post-pandemic world look like? What, what, uh, what are some of the special challenges? What are some of the opportunities and possibilities for preaching in this time and space? So looking forward to the conversation a great deal. Uh, so our guest, uh, Tim Sensing. Tim's been at the Graduate School of Theology since 1999, uh, coming from uh, years of being a congregational minister before coming here uh, and teaching practical theology and, um, and teaching preaching courses. Uh, so Tim, thank you for joining us today. And um, another colleague of ours, uh, Dr. Mason Lee. Welcome, Mason. Uh, Mason came to the Graduate School of Theology uh, about 20 years after Tim did. Um, <laughs> and uh, in about 2020, his background is in practical theology and in preaching and homiletics as well. Both Mason and Tim uh, preach often and think and practice good preaching, and uh, just a delight to have the two of you join us for this conversation today. So, Mason, welcome. Uh, and um, uh, uh, to those of you who are joining us today as, as part of the uh, viewers of this, just a couple of notes. Um, utilize the chat feature to let us know where you're coming from and to talk to the full group. If you want to raise a comment or a reflection for the group, if you've got a question, and we'll take time for questions as we get into the second half of the hour, I'm asking that you would use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask that question. That's what I will be monitoring for questions uh, for Tim and Mason as we get on into the conversation. So feel free to be uh, uh, using uh, the Q&A and pose your questions as we get into some, I think, some really significant conversations. Uh, this afternoon. All right, before we get into this conversation, as is our practice, let's acknowledge and invite the presence of God into our space. We invite you into a minute of silent prayer, and I'll break that silence and close that prayer in just a minute. Let's, let's come to the quiet together. Eternal God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we acknowledge you in this presence, and we acknowledge you as a God who speaks. So bless us in this conversation, we pray today, as persons called to speak on your behalf. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Well, Tim, Mason, in this time and space, you're engaged in congregations, you're involved with uh, with ministers. As you think about the practice of being a preacher today, the life of a preacher, what are what are some of the challenges that you see present that um, that gnaw, gnaw on preachers today? Tim, could I start with you? what What are some things that you would name as challenges that um, that ministers are facing? Well, when we start talking about a post-pandemic world, uh, I think that there's been lots of conversations, and you've had lots of those same conversations here on uh, intersections about the difficulties of being in a post-pandemic world, uh, and we don't need to rehearse all those. Uh, those writings are coming out, some studies, some researches, research is coming out on all of that, and just read a study to today uh, about that, but you specifically asked us about preaching, uh, 
And what I've seen in preachers is nothing really different than what was pre-pandemic. That one of the primary things that has been at the heart of, of a lot of the anxieties about preaching are, are still there. Uh, they just get represented in different ways. Now I'm on screen. Now I'm podcasting. Now I have some technology issues. But I, I think what really is uh, at the heart of a lot of folks with preaching is this underlying anxiety about whether I'm good enough, whether mm -hmm. I can perform well enough, whether I am liked. I mean, preachers, we, we like to be on stage. We like to be liked. We like to have thumbs up and we like to have clicks and and technology and comment sections and technology has, has in may, many ways, uh, has increased that, has come at it from a different angle, but it's the same tensions that we've been having. And, and oftentimes we use some of the same kind of metrics. Uh, we use metrics of attendance and contribution and who comes to my church versus who goes to that church. And now it's who clicks on my uh, YouTube presentation and and who's tuning in on my Facebook uh, when I'm there on Sunday. So I think a lot of the post-pandemic issues with preaching are predominantly, the way I see it, are the same as they were right. free. Getting down to the sense of, am I good enough? You know, this sense of insecurity that, that's present. Mason, what, what would you add to that? Yeah, I would... I sort of trace it back in my own thinking, the, the sort of conviction that's driving my teaching and thinking about preaching is that we're, the challenge is, it's never been more important that preachers be thinking theologically about what they're doing. Mm. And yet we're in a context in which preachers are being pressured in every way under the sun to think every way other than theologically about what they're doing. Uh, right, all of the, the challenges and circumstances of, kind of political partisan climates, those polarizations, uh, what Tim talked about, the questions of, of identity and am I liked or not, and what do I have to do to attract listeners, and how do I compare to, you know, to the person down the street or that, that my congregant watched on, you know, that morning before they came to hear me, and now I'm compared. I think all of that fundamentally stems from the, the challenge to what does it mean to think theologically about what we're doing in climates that pressure us to think every other way besides theologically? And so how do you recover a theological vision of what it is you're doing that sustains you in the midst of those things that are always challenges for preaching, I think? So it's like, how do you transcend that? Yeah. Yeah. Randy? Well, it seems to me one of the things that the internet has done is... Uh, now you're competing against the whole preaching world. I, I mean, I I said people used to not know how mediocre their preacher was, but they know now. Uh, and and if they wanted to hear preaching, they had to go to church. And that's that's not true anymore. You can hear all the preaching you want to, anytime you want to, whoever you want to. And that I, I think that does put pressure on the on the local preacher. Yeah. And I think before congregation our four walls our church they were still coming to this building but then the pandemic said well we're going to have church at home and you're going to have church in your living room and because it's necessary it's a way to, to love each other in terms of the pandemic and and oftentimes uh communities or uh rules by governors or mayors made it essential that you have church in your couch and they found out that, hey, I then can have church uh, across state lines, and I can have church somewhere else, and I don't have to go to these four walls. I don't have to come to, to me. They can come to somebody else. I think, again, that just increases the anxieties. Well, in some ways, it makes you begin to wonder if, if you can get preaching anywhere, then what's the good of a preacher? Mm -hmm. uh, how... Uh, uh, Mason, I'll pick on you. Uh, what, 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 what good is a preacher? <laughs> yeah, I think in a lot of ways you've nailed it, Carson. That this is sort of this is the question. I think that is unique for our times, right? If you follow Charles Taylor and this work on a secular age, right? Um, I think we're living in a time when belief in God is is in dispute, right? It's 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 being uh, 
All right, it's argued over. It's not a, it's, a, and then what that means is that it raises the question for people whose job is to talk about God, right? In a context when people doubt belief in God, what good is a person who talks about God? Um, and that that leads us to all of these all of these questions about measuring well, how do I attract people? It just leads to all of it. So your question, what what good am I? What good is a preacher? Again, this is the the theological component, right? You uh, you are what good is a preacher? A preacher is someone who is invited to actually point to the ways in which God is still at work in the world and gets to speak about the things of God. Um, and the ways in which God is still present, and to point out uh, to point out these places of transcendence in our in our everyday lives. Hmm. Well, that begins to make me think. Then, how would we, if these are some of the ra- realities that ministers are facing as preachers wrestle with identity and the role that they play in a, in a world where you could listen to a hundred sermons besides your own. Uh, um, that makes me begin to think, well, then what, how would we begin to construct the work of being a preacher? What does a preaching, what does the preaching life look like uh, in, in light of that, right? We're, we're faced with some, some, um, some interesting times, and that's where I'd really want to kind of engage you all. Uh, Tim, what would be something, you're thinking about the way forward, what would be a, something you might highlight that might be a constructive either practice for ministers to engage in or a way of being that you would offer, particularly in light of some of the things we're naming here? Yeah, I think when you start talking about vocation and identity, you have to start thinking about why did I get into this to begin with? Why am I a preacher? Why was I drawn into being a preacher uh, in in the the pastorate uh, in so many ways? Uh, And that's also think that's rooted into how we think about ecclesiology and how we think about the church. Mm. Uh, the pandemic kind of broke down. Well, if ecclesiology is not something done within these four walls, because we got misguided thinking that church was something that happened in a particular defined space. Uh, but as I think about it, uh, the, what drew me into my call to follow Jesus is a relationship with God and then a relationship with God's people. And and when I look back at even some of the ancient rhetoric about ethos and how do you create identification, uh, that there are ways to do that orally, that some folks can do that. uh, It's just natural in their bones and they can get on the screen and it just naturally comes across the screen. Uh, But for most of us, it's all about developing relationships with people that I am united with in the body of Christ. And that's what transcends these four walls of of a church building. And that's what's going to transcend above preaching is how I then connect with people in in relationship uh, with people, because it's with this particular group of people that I'm serving and I'm loving and I'm caring about, uh, not some, some group out there that, you know, I'm going to have to get a plane ticket to go to their, conduct their funeral because they live five states over when they died and I'm their only ecclesial person. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be a little bit odd. Yeah, so relationality matters Mm -hmm. uh, in the preaching task. Yeah. Mason, I'll turn to, what, what, I'll turn to you. What would be something that might help us move into a, a, move forward in thinking about the work of preaching or living the preaching life today? Uh, So from my my own experience and my work with my students, I think one of the things I'm, I'm sort of sensing is a need to recover what is actually the context in which preaching is happening. Um, And is it a context of political partisanship and division? Yeah. Is it a is it a context of social upheaval and change? Yes. But I sort of begin from my own theological conviction that the first and primary context of preaching is that preaching is happening in the world where God is doing stuff, right? A fundamental conviction that that God is at work in the world and God is on the move and God is, is acting and the ministry of God is ongoing. And therefore, my ministry, the first and primary context of my ministry is the context of God's work. 
which I think sh- changes the way we we locate our preaching and and which then gives us an opportunity, right? That if if the first context to which I am paying attention to in my preaching is God's work in the world, right, and the ongoing ministry of Jesus Christ, then that helps me, I think, in some way, it, it's an invitation to reframe what's going on around us in light of that context, that we, yeah, that we we see these things that are happening here and now, we see them differently, and we we understand them differently because it's not a context in which God is absent. It's a context in which God is is imminently present and active and moving, right? And so then my my preaching becomes helping those around me to to name that and see that. You know, the tax ta- tax task of the preacher in that particular context is ever new and ever fresh, right? It's in this moment. What what am I seeing? And the role of the preacher is to to name that, right? Yeah. And it's to and it's to and it's to name that and to help our congregation understand that as Christians and to understand it theologically, right? That in light of the ongoing ministry of God, you know, here's what's opening before us. So let, let me press on that because that's that seems to be really important. Uh, there's a strand of contemporary preaching that uh, let's how do I describe it? Um, well, Tom Long describes it as wisdom preaching. It's giving it's giving good advice. Let me let me give you three suggestions for for your week ahead. Um, and as I as I talk to ministers, they are scared to death that they're going to be irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it would be a shame to to miss some great moral crisis and look back twenty or thirty years and say, okay, we didn't we we just missed that when we said we we set it out. Um, but I, but I take it that you're thinking, okay, we, we need to kind of get back to, uh, what does God have to do with any of this? I mean, it seems outrageous to say that in our preaching, God seems sort of irrelevant, but, uh, I got, just pre- press into that. How, yeah. how is God the most relevant thing in the world to the preaching task? Yeah, so I think in some ways this gets back to Carson's earlier question, right, about what are the kind of commitments or things that can sustain us. And I, I think, right, my earlier comment that it's never been more important to think theologically about what we're doing means that uh, it's never been more important for us to understand what are the basic convictions that I hold as a preacher about who I believe God is and about Jesus is, right? And so this is where mine kind of come on the table, right? Um I think part of it is a recognition that I can't actually truly understand what's going on without first having some understanding of who God is, right? This is my own theological conviction that um, my knowledge of myself is only true to the extent that it's that I get there through my knowledge of God, right? That um, this is my own kind of theological cards on the table. And so therefore, right, so the sermon, three tips for being a better employee or spouse. Well, the challenge of that is it tries to kind of abstract what that means apart from any understanding of who God is or who God is revealed in Jesus Christ, where in fact, it's the opposite, that I'll I'll only understand those other things that I want to speak wisely about to the degree that I'm first have some sense of who God is and what God is up to in the world, right? I can only speak truthfully about these other things to the degree I'm speaking truthfully about who God is. Right. So I, I really only know myself when I come to know who how God sees. Yes. Right. I can't know myself or the human situation apart from the God in whom we live and move and have our being, right? Yeah. You know, Tim, I, could I draw you in here a bit? I've heard you use language like that when a preacher preach, I hope I'm not, mis- you, you correct me, <laughs> but it's important to preach in the present tense or you, you use some of that kind of language. It, does that relate to some of this here? Yeah, I, I think uh, when I think about preaching and task and skills sets and those kinds of things, uh, I think about listening and we were all trained to, to listen to the text to listen to scripture. Uh, mm-hmm. Mason has been talking a lot about listening to, to God and, and observing and seeing God in the world and what God is up to. And so listening, paying attention to, attending to these 
Uh, and when I think about how I was taught to listen to text, I was taught to listen to this is occasional literature that, that Paul is writing to a particular time, a particular place, particular people, about particular issues. And Paul has listened, or Matthew has listened, or Joshua has listened, whatever the, the particular text happens to be, that these are, this is occasional literature. But I'm, I'm living now in the 21st century, and I have to pay attention to people. Uh, that I'm working with, and I'm, I, and and far as being relevant, the only way I can be relevant is is if I've attended to that, if I've listened to them, if I know what's going on in their lives, what across from the coffee table when I'm when I'm drinking coffee with them in their living room, and they're pouring out their soul, or the hospital room, or at Starbucks, uh, and I've and I've paid attention and I listen, and then this this theology. Uh, knowing what I believe about God, how God has, has intersected my life and how I want to give bear witness to that, uh, to their lives, that I do that in the present tense. I don't explain some past tense word to a past tense people that have long died. I'm preaching a present tense word uh, to people that are alive, that are in front of me, that I'm getting to know, developing relationships with, about how they participate in the ongoing work of God, and how they will be drawn into the future of God's intended future uh, of their lives. And I think that's present tense preaching. And it's because I know their present tense realities. That's good. That's good. I want to, there's so much here that could be explored, but I want to press a little further into thinking about the preaching task itself. Um, and begin to ask, in what ways does some of this kind of thinking, this theological frame of living in the present tense, of paying close attention to the text, to the presence of God, to the community, to contextuality, um, I'm thinking of, you know, Bart's old saw of, you know, the Bible in one hand and the, uh, the newspaper in the other, uh, the Word of God, the Word of man. Uh, we're living in those kind of spaces, but because of the temptations and the challenges we've named earlier, I think both of you have been thinking a lot about how do we how do we even begin to move to crafting a sermon and uh, kind of living in that kind of space. Um, Mason, let me uh, kind of go your go your way a minute. Um, what what might be a a way of paying it? How would I begin even constructing a sermon and keeping a theological uh, thread at the center of all of that? So I'm not just saying, oh, well, I'm going to preach the parable of the, the soils here, <laughs> and I'm going to have four parts because they got four kinds of soil. Um, help me out. How would, how would I honor this kind of theological frame we've been talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's something very simple. So the, the way I think about this is has really been shaped by a little book by Nancy Lammers Gross called If You Cannot Preach Like Paul. And in that book, she she uses this turn of phrase that says, if you can't, that says the goal of preaching is not to not to say what Paul said, but it's to do what Paul did. Hmm. And if you think about what Paul is doing, right? Paul is Paul is not repeating something what paul is doing is looking at the situation what's going on around him and he's trying to articulate what god is up to and what this community of faith should do in light of the revelation of jesus christ mm -hmm. and how that fundamentally changes things and so for me then what i'm trying to do in my preaching and what i teach with my students is uh, your goal is not necessarily to spend the entire sermon trying to explain what paul said you're trying to do what Paul did. And that leads me to just a really basic thing in terms of how we frame what is the what are we communicating in the sermon? And so this is an That's example good. in my in my preaching class, uh, we we deal with what's called core affirmations. And that's the uh, that's, you know, if someone were to stop a hearer on their way out the church and ask, what was that sermon about? Ideally, it's the core affirmation. But I make my students write their core affirmations, their single sentences, and they have to write it in a very particular way that I say, you can preach about anything, but the first two words of your core affirmation have to be the words, but uh, because God, because God have to be the first two words. Mm 
And what I have found is that starting with God actually then reframes and reshapes the way we would typically go about preaching. Um, because it puts God, something as simple as putting God at the beginning of our core affirmation, the, the sentence our sermon is about, actually then makes the sermon about God, and it reframes the whole thing theologically. And so I, I found that to be a really helpful way of, if the goal is to do what Paul did, right, which is make sense of our lives in light of Jesus Christ, then the place you start is with the God revealed in Jesus Christ. And so let that lead something as simple as what's the sermon about right well the sermon's about god so. right and, and i'd like to add you really want to talk about god uh, because the bible is the book about god the, the bible is god's book we've said god's word and if and god's the hero of this book and and that when you start talking about god and you make a core affirmation about god or a thesis statement about god or a theme statement about god or a focus statement there are lots of ways in which this is called that it's god with an active verb mm -hmm. and that active verb is really important and and i often want to think about that active verb or any active verbs not necessarily cognitive active verbs because god's understandable we can read the bible we can understand it hopefully our sermons are said in ways that are understandable. But I, I would like for those active verbs to be thinking about effective verbs and behavioral verbs, uh, talking about our deep emotions, God's ways of, of loving us, God's ways of being merciful to us, God's ways of being gracious to us, and, and, and think about that in, uh, in behavioral ways as well in terms of what God does, how God acts. That's good. So I'm, I'm I'm wondering about those core affirmation statements. That seems like a really nice update on on the focus and function thing of Tom Long from from years ago, and in some ways an improvement because it kind of keeps us from wondering. Uh, but but let's uh, fill in some of the rest of that statement. It, because God has yeah. Like, Blank. That is that's going to lead. Are you going to wind up with we should or we do blank blank blank? Is that what is that the way it winds up? Yeah, it sort of ends up. So then the second part of this that I always encourage people now is, I, I think another helpful maybe tip for as we're thinking about sermons is thinking about the language of invitation and participation, and how we think about what does it mean. So. Right. It starts with God. Where wherever we are, wherever we're heading, God is already out in front of us. Right. God is God is already there. Um, we're not dragging God to a place. God is already present there, which then means anything we do is participation and it's kind of following behind God. And so the second part of of the core affirmation language is it starts with God because God and then. You know, because God redeems, because God calls us, be, or because God loves, because God does whatever, um, the second part of that core affirmation is always we are invited to, we are empowered to, we are, it's never, I don't use the language of ought, must, and should um, personally, uh, and I encourage my students not to because I think compassion fatigue is a very real danger these days. Um, and when people there there's always more to do and there's always another good thing our congregants could do and there's a point where that just becomes overwhelming but i found if you reframe it just slightly as it's not something we ought must and should do but it's here's what god is doing and here's how god is here's how god might be inviting us to participate or here's how god is empowering us to bear witness um, and so I've often, though, it begins with God, but then when it turns to the, then our activity sort of flows out of the, because what God is doing. And our activity is always framed as it's participation in what God's already doing. And it's invitation to join God in what God is already doing. Thanks for that. Are there other ways in which just in framing uh, the work of a, uh, the framing of a, a sermon that we might want to pay attention to, Randy. You... Well, I, I, uh, for for both Mason and Tim, lay lay, lay what you're kind of uh, thinking about alongside uh, 
our older notions of either expository preaching, inductive preaching. How how is this a little little different thing than than maybe what some of our listeners kind of cut their teeth on, or I did for that matter? Well, I always uh, and what's made my career in terms of my writing career is following Craddock's uh, notion that we don't uh, learn about how to preach the Bible, but how does the Bible preach? And I think for so much of homiletic, old homiletic, even new homiletic, it's still a how to preach type of thing. And so whether you're doing uh, four pages of sermon, that's new homiletic. Uh, You're doing long breaking up focus and function statements into six parts, that's new homiletic. Uh, You're doing Lowry's loop, that's new homiletic. But it's a patterned way in which they are saying you need to follow. You follow these pattern ways of, of constructing the sermon. But if, if a text is doing something theologically, uh, then that may give me a different entry point. How does, this, how does the text do that rhetorically, literarily, uh, but also to think about how I can frame my sermon that way. And so if we take these focus and function statements, these core affirmations, I would want to put them in my conclusion. I want to take the audience there. And therefore, my sermon is, is evoked from this powerful theological conclusion, because uh, there's, there's, a, there's a reason why this text is, exists. And, I, and I'll say now in my classes, this is a live wire theology. And if you touch it, it'll zap you. And if you touch that live wire, and you need to make sure that the congregation is, is going there in some, some way. And, and you want it to connect to their lives, get back to your relevance question. And so I've got this long list of, of uh, possibilities about what's going on in their lives because I've listened to them at the hospital. I've listened to them drinking coffee. I've listened to them uh, uh, in all kinds of ways. Uh, and, I, and I know their heart. I know the prayer list. Uh, and, and then I start comparing that, that list of where they are and what's tearing up their lives and tearing up their days, tearing up their relationships. And I find, you know, in this text, here's this live wire of theology and where is their connection? And then I'm going to take the audience, starting with what's tearing up their days and taking them to that conclusion. Thanks, Tim. So that sounds like it can be expository, but it's, or it could be, but it it has a different kind of angle or posture. Um, Mason, you want to pick up with any of that? Yeah, I mean, to me, I think, and this is maybe where we talk about opportunities, right, is um, to me, this is one of the opportunities of preaching uh, today is, uh, so there's a lot of ways in which right? These sort of debates about sermon forms, you know, deductive or inductive, what's the role of story? You know, can you do a three-point sermon or not? Does it need to be narrative preaching, right? All of those debates that sort of that Tim's mentioned, I think there's a way in which we're, we're, we're past a lot of that. Um, You know, can you, can you do it inductive? Do you need to preach inductively or do you need to do a three-point deductive sermon? Yes. The answer is yes. You need to, you need to do both, right? Um, we're, I think, I think the question becomes, uh, how do we help, how do we preach in ways that actually help people perceive what, what matters and what is ultimate? Uh, and so what I find myself, uh, doing a lot less of these days in my own preaching with my students is, is I find myself explaining a lot less, you know, trying to explain the text, trying to explain historical backgrounds, you know, it's not that those things are not important. Um, but there are other contexts in church where those things are happening. And what I'm trying to do is, is help them in the sermon, sort of starting immediately with their own lives and experience and see how the reality of God revealed in Jesus Christ changes the way they perceive their lives and experience um, and opens up a new world of possibility in, in front of us. And so uh, Craig Barnes, who's a, an author I, and preacher I really like, he's got this notion of subtext where he talks about the job of preaching is to look beneath the surface level of things. Um, and that beneath the surface level is always going to call you to think theologically about 
who people are, uh, you know, as persons before God, about our desire to live lives that matter, about our desires to be included and to belong to groups and, and to be loved and known by others. Uh, and so I find myself sort of really hanging out in those, in those places in my, in my preaching, uh, really in a way that allows us to, I think there's a freedom when it comes to how you put a sermon together or forms that's, uh, that's maybe an opportunity now. What if, what if those other things you were talking about aren't happening any other place? Well, preaching's not, preaching can't be the total, right? Preaching is one of the avenues God uses, right? And so there's a question to, to be had there. The, my que what I would want to explore is, um, is my primary purpose in preaching, and again, if we put our cards on the table, right, is the primary purpose in preaching for me to explain historical background and to form and you know, to do Christian education, or is my primary purpose in preaching to do something else? Is it to name the present activity of God? Um, right, maybe it's both, and maybe the challenge is to do both of those, but I think that's part of where this comes back to what do we think preaching is, right? Yeah, I think the tension comes, Randy, when you talk about in, our, in this secular age, when people know less and less about the Bible, they know less and less about scripture, they know less and less about how to order their lives in the way of Jesus. And then the sermon is the only opportunity or the only place that they connect. If that's my context, if I've listened, then I may need to spend more time just saying, this is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus taught. And this is what, this is what the Beatitudes are in terms of, but I can still do that in a way that's present tense. I can still do that in a way that is, is holding on to this live wire of theology uh, and not become a, a history class. If it's a, it's a proclamation or a witness of God in the world, uh, and, and, and I'm they, then once they become disciples, then I can start to teach them all things as, as the, the Great Commission talks about and try to find then other places of connection where we might spend what might take an hour to explain something or might take an hour to, to have them in a classroom set, setting or something else. That, that's not where I begin with. That's not, and, and I think that preaching foremost is, is this witness of or witness to God. I want us to turn to some questions that are starting to come into the Q&A. And, &A. and um, um, so, uh, and this is a, a note to say to all of you viewers, hey, drop into the Q&A and, and leave your questions. Um, um, so, uh, so I'm signaling that. I want to kind of go back to this idea of subtexts a little bit, Tim and Mason. In some ways, that sounds like a, a place where we're trying to connect with something that's more existential with where people's hearts or lives or experience is. Am I reading, am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's right. And, and to me, this notion of subtext for my own preaching uh, was a really empowering notion because I think what it does is it helps us, it helps us as preachers sort of recenter ourselves on what is actually in our ability and what is not. And how do I speak to uh, to what's going on around me and not allow my preaching to be swallowed up by forces that are in some ways outside of my context that are beyond my control, right? I, my preaching alone, my preaching is not going to solve the issue of partisanship in our society, right? But what I can do is read, again, I'm reimagining theologically in light of the activity of God. And what I can do is speak to people's desire and sort of inbuilt need to belong and their desire to live lives of purpose and meaning. And I can speak to that mm -hmm. and I can help them under then understand that in light of a God who has claimed them and calls them. Uh, that, that's a little bit different function, but it is it, that is a much more manageable task for me as a preacher than, than what we might be tempted to try to do, right? I, I used to complain that my students, when they were going to preach a text, they would grab the first shiny thing in the text instead of 
listening more deeply. And kind of what your point is, too, is it's easy to become faddish in your preaching where you grab hold of the problem of the day instead of asking that deeper question of, well, Tillich would call it, what's the fundamental question of human existence that lies under that, that, that the question of God uh, in, in Jesus Christ actually has an opportunity to answer. You actually say something uh, uh, to that question. So maybe our, maybe our cultural analysis sometimes is, uh, it needs to be a, a layer deeper than it, than it sometimes is. Um, just picking up now with some questions that are popping up here. Um, uh, you know, during the pandemic, we began to ask the question, just how much weight can a sermon carry for the life of the church or a worship service carry for the life of the church. So let's, let's enter, engage that a little bit. Can you say something about the places where, uh, about places preachers might connect preaching with the larger formational work that happens elsewhere? How does preaching connect to formation or the larger work of, of forming a community of faith? Um, thoughts there, either one of you? Yeah, I, I think preaching, when you talk about formation, I, I always think about formation in terms of uh, the long haul. Formation is not something that happens instantaneously. It's not, formation is not going to happen at a, a singular preaching event. So they come together on Sunday, they listen. And while uh, I don't want to discount that something might happen at that moment, it's usually because it's connecting with moments that have happened prior to and they definitely need to connect to moments that are going to happen afterwards. And so uh, when I think about uh, preaching, I often think about this is my ministry of preaching, uh, which the, the 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever I'm doing on that particular Sunday morning is just part of a longer process when I think about formation and what I'm called to, to be, what I'm called to do. And and uh, not to try to put all my eggs in that one basket in terms of, of what I'm called to do, what I'm called to be as a, as a minister, preacher, pastor uh, of this local congregation. So that might be the first thing I might say is formation is it's a lifelong process into the perfection of God. It's a lifelong process into the holiness of God. Uh, and, and that's a journey, uh, a journey of sanctification that I'll partner with the spirit, I'll partner with others. Uh, within the congregation, I'll partner with other ways in which the church engages people in relationships. Yeah. And I would say, again, this is where I, I think a more robust theological vision of what it is we're doing, right? This of thinking theologically, it's actually a freeing and a liberating thing for preachers, right? Because one of the temptations is to think it's up to you. Um, and, and what this, uh, that, that you're sort of on your own to figure it out. This is what I, I, when I talk with my students, one of the things I say is one of the greatest dangers to their preaching is going to be practical atheism, where you, you say, you know, we believe in God, we believe in Jesus, but we don't really think they're doing anything now. It's sort of up to us. Um, but recovering this, this notion that the first context of preaching is God's activity and what God is up to in the world. In some ways, it frees the sermon from having to bear that weight that we might want to be tempted to put on it, right? That my sermons, uh, what sermons do is ultimately up to God. Um, and that's actually the appropriate posture to take towards preaching. Now, that doesn't mean I, I stop preparing. It doesn't mean I stop working and I neglect those things. Uh, but it does mean I have, I think, what I would call an appropriate recognition of what sermons are and how they fit in the larger work and scale of the ministry of my church, my congregation, and in the purpose and economy of God. Playing that out a little bit further, uh, another questioner is asking about uh, just the general anxiety and uh, angst that is present in a lot of our churches. Um, and you add to that the perceived decline of, of uh, the, of Christian faith and Western culture, et cetera, et cetera. How do we how do we attend to some of that, and how does our preaching attend to that, without we us ourselves as preachers becoming anxious? Um, 
I'm, I'm Mason, I'm kind of inclined to ask you to speak to some, or at least lead off here. Uh, it seems to me one, one thing is maybe to think a little bit again about our theology. Um, but I think that's right, right? Um, right, I think, again, returning to what do we believe to be true? What is, right, what is the stuff that's in our bones, um, right, that, those kinds of commitments about God being at, you know, the, the way, the really flippant way I say it with, with my students is, well, did God raise Jesus from the dead or not? Um, and, and what do I believe to be true about God, about the world, about how God relates to the world, and then let my preaching flow from that? But the other thing I've become even more convinced of is, is thinking theologically and at the same time being willing to think smaller and in more particular around and refocusing on, on you know, I can't, I can't do anything in my preaching about the decline of, of Christianity in the United States. I can preach to my people whom God has called and gathered in this particular time and place, and through my preaching and through my ministry, through the grace of the Holy Spirit and the mercy of God, participate in forming them into a people that more look like the image of Christ, like right? That. One of those things I can't do anything about. So it's, it's, am I willing to attend to the good work God has given me to do? Mm -hmm. Or do I focus on the things that I actually can't do anything about, right? Sufficient unto tomorrow are the worries thereof, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tim, what else would you say about, you know, anxiety in the pulpit? Yeah, when I think about, you know, what am I called to be? Uh, I'm not called to be a therapist. Uh, that's a worthy profession, but I'm not, I wasn't trained to be a therapist. I'm not called to be uh, the CEO of a church and a church organization. At least I wasn't called to that. I know churches are calling some folks into those ministries, but as a preacher, I wasn't called into that, that role. I'm not called to be a social worker. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing. We see more and more students are wanting to do uh, social work and, and social justice kinds of ministries. Uh, but I, when I walk into a hospital room or I walk into someone's living room, uh, I am who I am called by God to be in those places. And, and sometimes uh, I think we get, uh, uh, we try to put too much on our, on our shoulders in terms of, of living outside the bounds of, of, of our calling. And so when I think about anxiety, uh, how has God through scripture, through the church, dealt with anxieties to the ages. How does one bring about confidence? How does one overcome fear? And so we return back to uh, those foundations that have always been available to the church, the resources that are always been available to the church to address anxieties, to address fears. We're not the first group of folks that have had anxieties. You know, when, when Hitler was marching across Europe, anxieties, when uh, there was a bubonic plague. There were anxiety. There's this world has been filled with plenty of places in which fear and anxiety and attacks on the church or the church's place in the world has as and, and I believe that in some ways that's where the church has shown forth the brightest is because the church will say uh, our confidence is found in the resurrection. Our confidence is found in the fact that Jesus is God's son. Uh, our confidence is found as far as our relationships with one another, the fact that God is a relational being, God the Father, God the Son, the God the Spirit. So I think that, and, and I am as a theologian, preacher, called to help the church to always root itself back into the very foundations that have always been there for the church. Yeah. I'm thinking in Romans 8, where Paul takes the groaning of the world and the Christians and the spirit with utter seriousness. Mm -hmm. But um, I wouldn't really call it anxious. I, it, you know, there's this kind of word of, of hope into that. And so, you know, I, I think truth is our friend and the church is in decline. Okay. I, I, I don't have any need to deny that. There's all sorts of bad things I don't have. It's part of the groaning of the world, but it's in this context of uh, uh, hope, in, hope in Jesus Christ. And that's that's a very different place to talk about those things. 
Yeah. Think about the Beatitudes and how countercultural the Beatitudes are, because when the world says, what's a flourishing life? What's an abundant life? What's a blessed life? The world doesn't list anything that's in those Beatitudes. It doesn't list about being poor in spirit. It doesn't list humility. It doesn't list uh, someone who's hungering and thirsting. It doesn't list uh, these. But the Beatitudes come along and says, for you to follow in my way of being salt and light to the world, uh, you're going to have a flourishing life if you live this. And, and if you live these kinds of ways, uh, because of this, you're just the kingdom of heaven. That's good. Another question here is kind of pushing us into thinking about um, the scope of breadth of preaching. He notes that he's in a highly secular context near a state university, living and working where you've got multiple visions of reality and uh, multiple uh, frames about uh, God or gods. Uh, you've got major world religions and no doubt other things floating in there. So uh, how do you attend to that kind of space and help people see God revealed in Jesus Christ without becoming an academic lecture, trying to navigate multiple narratives that are in pl place within a congregation. How would you attend to that? This kind of gets back again to how much freight does a sermon, a sermon carry? Well, I'm just a conversation partner in those. And so I've got to listen. I've got to respect. I've got to honor and and I'm going to show forth love and uh, as I listen in the into those places, and and I'm just I'm just one voice uh, in that larger conversation that's taking place. But because I'm a Christian voice, uh, I'm going to be confident about my voice, and and I have a place at the table. And if I've provided respect, if I've provided listening, uh, then I I anticipate I hope. That they then will give me the opportunity to, to voice because I have. Uh, so being a, a person who brings forth a profession of faith doesn't mean that I'm less confident or I'm weak or I've got to dominate. Uh, but I so I have a place at the table and I'm confident at that place in the table. Yeah. Mace, I interrupted you. You started to say something. No, I again I, I think it goes back to again, what are my main theological commitments as a preacher? Uh, what do I believe to be true? And then also, again, kind of returning and, and thinking, you know, what is actually mine to do in the specific context in which I'm I'm preaching? And then again, Carson, just to your comment about, I think also having a realistic kind of a humble realism about what, what does a preaching ministry over time do? And how does that need to partner with other aspects of, of the church, right? That's just something I'd throw out. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to I'm going to bring us together here and, and begin to land the plane. I want to thank Tim, you, and Mason for this time together. Uh, this has been a delightful uh, conversation. There's some other questions that are floating around, but in, in essence of time or in honoring time, I want to try to land the plane here. So, Tim, Mason, and Randy, I'm going to ask you here in just a moment to what would be your last word? What would be the thing that you'd want to leave uh, us with today? And while you're thinking about that, let me just simply say to all of you who are participating today, thanks for being a part of this. Our next intersection event is a look at chaplaincy. We have two board certified chaplains, Casey McCullum and um, uh, Paul Riddle that will be with us on Valentine's Day, uh, February 14th. I think the title is something like everything you wanted to ask about chaplaincy, but we're afraid to ask. Uh, we're going to explore what hospital chaplaincy looks like. It's a, it'll, it'll be a great conversation, particularly for even for those of us who are not chaplains, but what is the work of ch uh, hospital chaplaincy? Uh, so that's coming up on the February 14. Uh, let me just go around the room and Tim, can I call on you first? What would be something that you wouldn't want to leave everybody with today as you reflect about our conversation. As I, as I perceive, uh, talk to, to some preachers, and I mostly intersect with uh, DMIN students as they're talking about preaching and along those lines, uh, that I do think there's a great deal of anxiety. I think that anxiety is rooted into 
a, a fuzziness in terms of what they understand their vocation, a, a fuzziness in terms of what they understand their identity, mm -hmm. a, a fuzziness in terms of understanding their calling. And, and I, I, and I see that, that when we have, and, and mine might look different than yours in my particular time and space and location. In fact, even if I move two states away, 10 years later, I'm at another time that may change because I'm being responsive uh, to the different location. Uh, but if I've got a, a definite understanding of my identity, my vocation, my calling, and I'm clear about that, uh, that brings about assurance, that brings about confidence, that brings about rest, mm -hmm. it prevents burnout, uh, it prevents uh, uh, me, it helps me to become someone who's not just languishing in ministry, it helps me to become someone who flourishes in ministry. Uh, both groups of folks can stay in ministry, languishing and flourishing, and I'd rather be among that second group than the first group. Clarity, clarity of focus, vision, identity. Yeah. And it the boundaries of who I am. Yeah. Yeah. Mason, what would you offer as we uh, close out here? Yeah, I, I find my prayer for preachers these days being, uh, in some ways, it's Paul's, you know, may the eyes of your heart be enlightened. Um that we we live in times when preachers are are anxious, and yet I'm I'm finding I'm also finding that Jesus Christ is risen and God is at work, and if we can perceive that, it just might be the case that these are opportunities to do real ministry, mm -hmm. um, and that what we perceive now as anxiety and as uncertainty and as challenges that are impossible to overcome. They might just be the fields in which God is doing something exciting and we're invited to participate in. And we might just see what good work we have to do. To do the work of the minister. <laughs> I think somebody said that once. Uh, Randy, how would you close us out? What would be your word? I think that the, the people who are coming to church desperately need to hear the work of God in Jesus Christ, whether they know it or not. And, you know, you need to be able to, after the sermon every day, say, okay, this is what I said about, about God today. And then we'll look up in 20 years and see where we are. But, uh, you know, and, and I think Tim's point to do that week after week after week. Uh, that's, that's what we have. That's what we have to give. And uh, it may be, it turns out to be more than we thought it was. Yeah, very good. Well, may God bless us all in the work of doing that very thing. Randy, would you would you offer a good word, a benediction to close us out? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. To him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore, world without end. Amen.